In today's video, I'm going to teach you how to make a classic cologne style perfume. And the way I'm going to do that is by showing you a demo formula that I came up with, and then I'm going to walk through it and explain what the different raw materials do. So if you're interested in making your own cologne style perfume, then definitely watch to the end of this video. So a cologne perfume or eau de cologne as it's called. I'm not talking here about what's called cologne in the USA, which is essentially at the moment a general term used to describe perfume for men in general, I believe, uh, but rather eau de cologne, which is a very classic type of perfume formulation. And this was actually very popular in the 1800s. So originally there were these things called toilet waters, which were in modern day terms, we would just call them weak perfumes, and that's actually where the term eau de toilette came from originally, and one of those types of perfumes was eau de cologne. So I've recently been studying some of these different toilet water style perfumes, and I'm doing a full module on that in my online course, which I'm currently constructing. So if you're interested in learning more about those, then definitely check out the online course when it's finished. However, for now, in this video, what I thought I would do is actually take the most famous of those toilet water perfumes, the Eau de Cologne, and actually give you a little bit of a crash course in how you can go and make an Eau de Cologne style formula with the starter kit of raw materials that I described in a previous video. I'll put a link in the video description for the video where I go over the uh, starter kit raw materials. So if you haven't already watched that video, then you can go check it out. But if you have that starter kit, then you'll already be able to make the formula in this video. And if you're interested in the course where I go over all this stuff in way more detail, um, then when that's out, I'll also put a link to that in the description of the video. So going back to Eau de Cologne, what it essentially was, was a refreshing and short lived type of perfume. And these perfumes, um, essentially the reason that they were quite popular, probably apart from the fact that, you know, a lot of things at the time smelled a lot worse than they do today because people didn't have such good hygiene. So, you know, a sharp, refreshing perfume would have been really helpful. But it's also at the time they didn't have as many raw materials as they had now. Um, they just had a few, you know, different essential oils and some other extracts and things, um, you know, also maybe the very first synthetics coming in. So they didn't have that much to work with. So this was kind of the composition that naturally arose from the palette of raw materials they had. And um, this was something that perfumers at the time could throw together and, you know, smelled quite nice, which, you know, if you go and throw together raw materials, especially essential oils, you don't necessarily always come up with something that smells that good. So this is just a natural product, we could say, of the period. Anyway, the basic composition of an eau de cologne type perfume is as follows. It's essentially dominated by a load of citrus oils, the key ones probably being orange, lemon and bergamot, though you can use different citruses as well if you want to. So they have a load of citruses and quite often, most of the time, this is also complemented by some kind of orange blossom element. Probably the most common one of these being Neroli, which is the essential oil of the blossoms of the bitter orange tree. So you can also get uh, Orange Blossom Absolute, which is a, instead of steam distilling them into a central oil, you have an absolute extraction, which is a different process. Um, you could also make it with that. And often you also just use Petit Grain Essential Oil, which is the essential oil of the leaves and kind of twigs rather than the uh, blossoms themselves, which is a lot cheaper, um, but still shares a lot of elements in the way it smells. So any of these kind of Orange Blossom raw materials, you can really go and use these to go and make your uh, Eau de Cologne Star formulation. Then finally, alongside that, they often added uh, little hints of aromatic herbs. So when I say aromatic herbs, that's the term I use to describe certain things like mint, lavender. Uh, these two come from the Lamiake family. And um, there's other herbs in that family you can also use, but also uh, similar other herbs. So you can also go and use things like thyme, uh, clary, sage, uh, rosemary, other things as well. So you've got a lot of options there, but usually in these colognes, they don't go and use large doses of those things. They just go and add a little dash. You can imagine it like a little dash of seasoning, how you'd put those herbs uh, in food that you might cook as well. So that's pretty much uh, all there is to it. So I won't go over, you know, too much detail, the ins and outs of these eau de colognes. Uh, if you're interested in learning in more depth, then do check out the course when that's finished. Uh, for now, I thought I'd give you a basic formula with the starter kit that you can go and make and follow along with yourself. So here is a formula. Now, the way I've arranged this formula is starting with the top notes and then finishing with the base notes because I thought that would kind of uh, make it easier to understand the actual composition. Um, and we'll find out that these things are quite top heavy. So actually, um, 
If we have a quick glance at it, we can see that firstly, we've got a lot of citrus oils in here. We've got that lavender, um, you know, when I was talking about the aromatic herbs, you can have a dash of seasoning. Um, and then we've got these other things as well. So we'll go and talk about those in a second. But what I want to note first is actually the concentration here. So if we go and look at the concentration of the formula here, it's 7.28%, which by modern day standards would probably just about be an eau de toilette. And you know, that is also fitting with the theme of toilet water and all that. Um, however, it's a little bit misleading because if you go and look at that concentration, you'll find out that 3% out of that 728 so in relative terms, that's 40%, basically, almost half of the composition is just hedione. And that is something I've added to this composition to kind of make it a bit lighter, more diffusive and radiant. And it's quite airy, but it's not contributing that much to the actual strength of the smell. It's more just, let's say, something that's in there to help it perform a little bit better, you know, make it a bit long lasting, make it a bit kind of more fresh and radiant, and it helps you uh, smell that perfume better, you know, when you're actually wearing it. So that's more of a modern raw material, which wouldn't be included in a traditional cologne, um, but it fits very well. And part of the reason for that is Hedione actually has a bit of a citrus facet. So if you don't know the smell of Hedione, it's kind of thought of as this light diffusive floral note, um, and it's kind of related to some other jasmine molecules, uh, but it doesn't really distinctly smell of anything in particular. It's just you know, generally quite a light, airy, uh, smell and it's often used in modern perfumes at quite high dosages really to help with like I just said before um, things like the performance the diffusivity and giving you that kind of uh, big kind of aura that soft uh, you know kind of feeling now it's also got a bit of a citrus facet when you smell it which makes it really perfect for this kind of formula because it's quite dominated by the citrus notes and a lot of top notes it means there's not actually very much going on in the base so putting Hedio in there actually helps you Kind of have something a bit more substantial uh, later on in the formulation it means it doesn't kind of taper off quite so quickly as you'd usually expect for a clone type formulation and i just think it really blends in there well so anyway before we actually go into the details i've got my sample up here which i made earlier and we're going to go and smell it i'm going to let you know what it smells like so it's pretty um you know it's pretty blended together quite nicely actually so i made this last week and it's gone and really melded itself uh, together quite well, which is something that's quite common for colognes. Um, but it's essentially just a fairly kind of, you know, it's not actually too shouty or as much as you might think for something with a lot of citrus oils, but it's essentially a very pleasant kind of uh, refreshing, kind of uplifting smell. And it's got some diffusivity to it, and it's got other kind of elements to it as well. Um, due to the things in the formulation. So you can kind of smell the Orantio coming through and we'll discuss that in a little bit. Um, but overall, it's just a nice kind of pleasant smell. And if you smell something before like this, this perfume uh, 4711, which is kind of a modern day perfume based on the original Eau de Cologne. Um, I think it's probably the most famous one doing that kind of thing. Um, it's kind of a similar kind of ballpark to this kind of smell. Now, you know, we were limited a little bit uh, on raw materials obviously, because I wanted to make sure we only use the palette of the starter kit. So, you know, there's other things we could add, but we'll talk about that at the end. Anyway, let's go and take a look at the actual formulation. So if we look at the first three lines, we've got lemon, orange, and bergamot, and these are the three citrus oils used in the perfume. And these actually essentially dominate the whole composition. And even in between these, bergamot is the biggest one by far. So if we combine the percentages of these all together, you know, if we remove that hedione from the formula, which I say is just kind of like a big backdrop padding, you actually find that these citrus oils make up more than half of the remaining composition. So that's just how much of a big uh, effect they are in this formula. So these things, um, this is kind of the core like smell. If you go and smell this perfume, you can smell citrus as let's say the main kind of note. And you've got bergamot as the main citrus note, which is, um, you know, it's kind of a nice, fresh, citrusy note. It's kind of hard to describe if you haven't smelled it. I definitely recommend, uh, if you're interested in perfumery, uh, to go and smell some bergamot. Um, that's pretty fundamental. But it's kind of like a, you know, it's a bit like something like an orange or, or another citrus, but it's less, let's say, sweet and sharp. It's a little bit more kind of softer. Um, and it's got its interesting own kind of characteristics to it. Um, but I would say it's a bit more fuzzy, um, and that's due to the presence of something called linalol uh, inside of it. 
Anyway, um, so you've got these citrus oils which make up the main part of the composition. And then we've also got down here this lavender oil. So if you look at this, I've just added a little bit of a dash of lavender oil. So the, the total citrus concentrations, I like to use the absolute concentrations. Um, so they add up to a total of, what's that, 2.2%. The lavender oil is just 0.2%. So that's a, about, compared to the citrus oils, the lavender is only about 10%. Um, of the amount of those so you can see that it's a much smaller component of the formula and it just you know goes on to add a little bit of a twist to the formula let's say without actually dominating the character so now here i've got something called dihydromersonol and this you can see again i've just added a really slight touch to it now this is a modern aroma chemical so they wouldn't have had that back when they're making uh, an original eau de cologne but this is used a lot in kind of fresh aquatic formulations these days. So if you think of all your stuff like your, uh, you know, your Eau de Sauvage, your uh, Davidoff Cool Water, they've got a lot of this thing called dihydromersonol. And it's kind of a little bit of an aromatic herbal note, uh, something like a lavender, but it's way, way, way cleaner and more aquatic. So this can make your perfume smell a bit more modern. Um, and a lot of people kind of like the smell because, you know, that's why it's become so popular in these types of formulations. Now this thing does have a tendency to make itself quite known. So while in some formulations in an aquatic kind of style thing, something that's more modern, I might use this at a higher amount. In this particular version, we wanted to have the focus remain on the citrus. So I put it in at you know only 0.1% um, as an absolute concentration, which honestly surprised me in that it was still noticeable in the formula. I think this level is about right. If you really like it, obviously you could go up. Um, and if you don't like it, or you want it to uh, be a bit more traditional, then you could, you know, take it down or remove it entirely. So next we have something called floral or florosa. Now this is a lily of the valley note, and again this is something that you wouldn't uh, traditionally necessarily have in a cologne. The thing about this, however, is it's quite a fresh um, floral note, and it's quite transparent. So it's a little bit like the Hedione. You could say the floral in this formula is the companion to the Hedione. And what it does is it adds a nice, fresh, uplifting scent without too much character. So you can think of it as this uh, floral acts as part of that big, nice, fresh backdrop alongside the Hedione. And then it's colored in by all of these citrus oils and the other things uh, afterwards. So again, this is why it's quite a high concentration because it's something that's not really adding like a main character to the smell. Um, it's kind of being colored in by the other things. Now again, uh, floral like the Hedione is longer lasting than the citrus oils. So it really helps um, make the formula last longer and it helps, um, you know, something like an eau de cologne you got to understand here, the thing about these citrus oils is they are very short-lived. So when you, say, to go to spray on your eau de cologne, if it was just the citrus oils alone, it would probably only last about half an hour. And these days, uh, you know, people want stuff to last a bit longer. And, you know, it's, it's not that like, convenient to always keep reapplying your perfume. So having uh, these longer-lasting things like Hedion and Floral, they not only make the formulation last longer, just out of the nature of themselves being longer lasting, they also add a slight fixative effect which helps those uh, citrus oils last that little bit longer as well. So, you know, overall, um, I think these two things really help. Now, now we go to Helianal. Now again, this is like more of a modern thing that I've added, uh, so you don't have to go and add this if you don't want to, but Helianal is more of an aquatic note. And what Helianal does is, since we've already got the dihydromersonol, um, the fresher citrus oils, and you know things like the Hedione, it really goes and harmonizes with those to just push that fresh element. Now we've got it here at 0.2%, so that is low enough for it to not be completely noticeable as an aquatic smell, rather just add quite a fresh a juicy facet to the formula, really helping those citrus oils pop, you know. Um, but if you wanted, of course, you could increase it a lot to make it more of an aquatic perfume, make it more modern, um, or you could remove it if you wanted to go more traditional. So next here we have Orantiol. Now Orantiol is the orange blossom note in this formulation. So because the starter kit didn't have uh, orange blossom or narrowly inside of it, um, I use this as a substitute. So it will smell better, obviously, this formula if you go and use a real, firstly, you could use a real orange blossom absolute or a narrowly essential oil. Um, you could also go and use your own 
Nerily or Orange Blossom Accord, which is a floral accord. Again, this is something I'll be talking a little bit about in my course, how you would uh, go and make that kind of thing. Um, and short of that, you can then go and do a substitution with maybe just one of those individual aroma chemicals which uh, you may use to make that uh, Orange Blossom or Nerily Accord. And the reason that I like Orantiol is because it's fairly powerful um, and long lasting, which when you've got a cologne type formulation like this, that you know is dominated by these citruses, which don't last very long, um, having an element in there, which fits in with the traditional cologne theme to some degree, um, and actually lasts longer, and it adds diffusivity, uh, it really helps um, the formulation work as a more modern perfume. So I quite like Orantiol. Um, and I will say that they did have Orantiol, you know, back a while ago. So even in kind of the 1930s, 1940s, um, when colognes admittedly weren't so popular then because they were using other types of perfumes more frequently, um, but even back then when some people might have made a cologne still, um, you could get something like Orantiol. So it's not completely unauthentic either. Now, the other thing about these cologne perfumes is often, as well as the narrowly, they often used um, a little bit of rose water in the perfume as well. So uh, while, you know, in our modern perfumery, it's a bit inconvenient for us to go and put rose water inside of something, and because that's not really a raw material that we would use, um, we can add a tiny, tiny, tiny drop of rose essential oil or a substitute. So in this case, um, what I recommended uh, for the starter kit was if you don't have rose essential oil or absolute, which is very expensive, you know, when I started perfumery, I didn't have that for a long time. Um, you can just use something like a rose base, which does like 90% of the job, it gets you most of the way there, and it's a lot cheaper. And also the added benefit is it's um, more reproducible as well, because a natural product is always gonna vary, you know, depending on how it's harvested, manufactured, etc. So the rose essence base is a very nice rose base, but of course you could use a different one like Rose Jivco, and just an absolutely tiny opener 5% I've got here uh, in the composition just goes to add that kind of heart uh, to the perfume. Again, it's not really trying to be the main smell here, you're not really meant to smell rose, it's just meant to uh, fortify that lingering element of the composition uh, that lives on after those citrus oils have mostly gone. Now here at the end we've got some Ambrofix aka Ambroxan and some uh, Ethylene Brassolate and these are basically um, fixatives. So traditionally when they made this kind of formulation um, or for a long time when they're traditionally making perfumes um, there's this concept of a fixative where you add something um, just a little touch of something usually to help the perfume last a little bit longer. Um, now, they often use things like different musks, um, sometimes real musk, which we don't use anymore. Um, they also use things like ambergris and they used other things as well, like, you know, coumarin, vanillin, whatever, depending on the formulation. Now, in an eau de cologne style formulation, you don't want anything that's too thick or heavy because the whole point of it is to be refreshing. So, um, but you could have seen them use something uh, like ambergris and musk, maybe a tincture of those in the formulation. Now, instead of using raw ambergris, we can just these days take the uh, one of the main molecules inside of that, which is called ambroxan, um, often sold under the name Ambrofix. And we can just add like the tiniest amount of that to add as a little kind of dash of fixative seasoning, uh, you could say. This thing's also a bit of an exalting agent, so it just helps the whole thing project and diffuse. So this is a really good thing to add. And then also the ethylene brassolate. This one is a musk. So this replaced something more classically, you know, you might have used some kind of musk tincture. Um, this is a very kind of widely used reliable musk um, that is quite soft and it doesn't really... Um, it's not too powerful or strong, so it doesn't add a strong musky note to the formula, which is good in this case because you know we want the citruses to shine. So this adds just the most slight kind of uh, soft uh, skin scent of a musk at the very end, which is fine. You know, it's actually quite pleasant. So there you have it. That is my eau de cologne formulation, limited only to the 30 raw materials that we had in the starter kit. Now, of course, like I said, you can make this a lot better if you had access to more raw materials. Uh, but the point of this video is more to be like if you're a beginner, you know, and you don't have all of these raw materials yet, and you actually just want to make something uh, practical and get some results, then this is something you can try to do as an exercise. So if you did have more raw materials, of course, you could go and add different orange blossom things first and foremost. So 
uh, whether it be Orange Blossom Absolute, um, Narrowly Essential Oil would probably be the main one along with Petsy Grain Essential Oil. These would be the two kind of things which would have commonly be used uh, traditionally. And then you can also go and use things like your own Orange Blossom Base, so there's that kind of thing. Now, you can also go and use other citrus oils, of course. Um, these probably are the most traditional ones, but of course you can experiment with other things like lime or yuzu or grapefruit if you want to be a little bit more creative. Then also traditionally, they would have used other um, herbs sometimes as this kind of seasoning. So you could also do things like rosemary, clary sage, peppermint, obviously are quite common ones. And then apart from that, I mean, I would say, honestly, I think the formula is fairly nice. It's a fairly good kind of like basic little formula here. Um, yeah, when I do smell it, I do think the Orantial comes through a little bit, right? So um, definitely replacing that with some petit grain or something would be probably the biggest change you could do to make it a bit more traditional. Um, but it still smells nice. And yeah, I mean, obviously, if you wanted to go more modern, you wanted to make more like a, a modern, like fresh perfume, less of a traditional perfume. You can go and add a little calo and up the helium now, make it more of an aquatic perfume, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of different things you could do with this uh, formula, but I thought I would just give you guys something nice and easy that you can follow and make yourself. So please do let me know down in the comments uh, if you made this and what you thought about it. And that's pretty much all I have for you. So uh, good luck with your perfumery, guys, and I'll see you soon with another video.